Welcome to today's webcast. This call is being recorded. And now to begin the program, I'd like to introduce Ms. Tracy Cook. Please go ahead. Thank you so much. Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's Fireside Chat webcast, Database re Replatforming the Last Barrier Between You and the Cloud, sponsored by Datometry. I'm Tracy Cook with Virtualization and Cloud Review, and I'd like to thank you all for joining us. Before we begin, uh, I'd like to take care of a couple of housekeeping details. Please feel free to type your questions into the Ask a Question box on the console at any time during the presentation. We'll address as many of your questions as we can during the live event. The entire webcast is being recorded and will be archived for future viewing, and we'll send you an email when the replay is available, and that should be in approximately 24 to 48 hours, and you can access the replay using the same link you use today. And now I'd like to introduce our presenters for the event. Today's moderator is Trevor Pott. Trevor is a full-time nerd and co-founder of eGreek Consulting Limited. He splits his time between systems administration, consulting, and technology writing. As a writer for virtualization and cloud review, he is keenly interested in the redefinition of the IT industry occurring because of the emergence of public cloud computing and what this means for virtualization administrators and IT practitioners. So Trevor, welcome and thank you for joining us today. Thank you very much and hello to everybody. Great. We also have Mike Waz, CEO and founder of Datometry with us today. He has spent over 20 years in database research and development in companies such as Microsoft, Pivotal, and Amazon. Besides the development of Datometry's database virtualization technology, he is the founder and architect of Green Plum's Orca Query Optimizer. Mike has 36 publications on the science of databases and 24 patents to his credit. Welcome, Mike, and thank you for joining us today. Thanks, Tracy, for the intro. Thanks for hosting us today. Excited to be here. Yeah, we're happy you're here too. And so we're in great shape with Trevor and Mike. And uh, now I'd like to turn the event over to Trevor. Trevor, please take it away. All right. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, before I get started on the uh, interview here, I would like to ask Mike uh, to please give us sort of the elevator pitch description of the company to get us started. All right. So we are a venture-backed startup. Actually, we just closed our Series A, um, and we pioneered what we call adaptive database virtualization. We solve what really is kind of the biggest problem, the biggest obstacle when enterprises move to the next generation of cloud. It's no longer so much about compute and storage, but really about how to take advantage of cloud native data management without having to rewrite, recompile, and reconfigure your entire ex uh, existing application environment. The Tometry effectively eliminates the need for database migration, and instead, with our product, enterprises can move to the cloud at a fraction of cost, time, and most importantly, risk. Even though we're a small startup, we get, as you can imagine, the attention from all the major players in this space already, from Amazon to Google and Microsoft, from Pivotal to Snowflake and a number of others. And we've developed uh, quite a number of partnerships already in this space with vendors as well as system integrators. As you can imagine, this is an exciting space to be in given what's all going on in the market right now. And so, yeah, I'm excited to be here and tell you more about the Tometry and our product. So you mentioned uh, that you were getting a lot of attention uh, from some larger companies here. This is not normal for startups, especially who are in such an early stage. Can you tell us why it is that you're getting uh, this sort of attention? Absolutely. Now, I think the biggest challenge here that we need to look at is what's happening in the market right now. And what you see is that a very well-established, large $40 billion market that the database market is today is getting completely redefined by the cloud, by cloud initiatives. And so this is for the first time that the entire real estate of databases comes on the market, so to speak, and within the next three to five to 10 years, this entire market will be replatformed to the cloud. 
So that means everybody is kind of scrambling already to kind of figuring out how to do this because the value proposition of going to the cloud is just so, so fundamental, so broad. And based with this background, obviously both enterprises as well as service providers are very sensitive to the kind of technology that we develop because it really addresses a, a searing pain, a very critical void right now in how people actually got to deal with databases and move to the cloud. Now, based on my own experience uh, moving applications from uh, database to database, that's not exactly an easy thing to do. Uh, so what does it take uh, to virtualize databases in this sense and, and, and allow applications to move uh, from underlying DB to underlying DB? And how does your technology work? Yeah, so we actually, well, spent quite a bit of uh, years in this space and very much to what you said before, it is an incredibly painful exercise. When you look though at exactly kind of the anatomy of uh, a database migration or moving between databases, it is primarily a process issue sprinkled with a lot of small but really pervasive technical issues. And so a lot of people in the past conventionally move into the application and try to fix the application to now work with a different database, which is a huge rewrite, reconfiguration, recompile effort. And what we do, on the other hand, is instead of actually going into the application and modifying the application, we work completely off the network and effectively intercept the communication, so to speak, and then in real time, translate that to the language and protocol of the new target database, and on the way back, uh, do real-time translation of results to feed it back into the application. And that means the application does not change at all and the application does effectively not even know that the database under it has changed. From a technical perspective, in a lot of ways, that is, when it comes to the real kind of translating and rewriting of things, not unsimilar to what people have done in the past, but the real kicker, and that's kind of the fundamental insight, is instead of going into the application, we just wait for the application to speak up, so to speak, and actually do this off the network. And that eliminates that whole um, non-scalable element of having to touch up all the applications. Okay. Um, I mean, in, in other areas of IT, uh, what you're talking about here might be called a shim or a parser uh, sitting in, in the data path and providing the ability for uh, an application to talk to something that it uh, thinks it's talking to, but in fact is talking to something completely different. Now, I've seen a lot of these things work well, and I've seen a lot of them work really, really horribly. When we're talking about data metry, how does this uh, impact performance? Um, how does it scale? What kind of resources does it consume? Uh, how does it integrate with everything else that we have? And what do we have to, to be concerned with when it comes to things like fault tolerance? All right. Well, we're obviously our, our solution works very well, so <laughs> no question there. But these are great questions. This is really what uh, prospects also bring up as the first thing when once they see what it is really what we, what we can do for them. So there are a couple of interesting elements that I want to call out. First off is we really sit off the network, off the network con um, connection. And that all gives us a space that is very cleanly defined. So we're not something that you link into an application or that you need to load into the database, etc. That gives us a very clean way of operating. The second point is what do we do as we translate queries on the way in and results on the way back out? We really rewrite the query text. We take the query text as it comes submitted from the application, take it apart, build a mathematical model to reason over it, optimize it. There's a lot of other things that are going on and this diagram is a, obviously a gross simplification of, of the exact details. And then we synthesize query and protocol for the target system. All that takes uh, in the range of 5 to 200 milliseconds typically. The queries themselves, however, run for seconds, for minutes, sometimes even uh, hours or longer. And so the overhead that we actually contribute is tiny. Usually we don't even show up on the performance radar at all. Um, and on the way back as we translate results, it's a similar picture. For the result translation, if you have really beefy queries, there's probably a little more that we need to do. 
but by and large, we're effectively invisible simply because the actual heavy lifting is always done on the database, and we don't implement any data kind of processing or query processing in the mid-tier. Okay. So what kind of databases does Datometry support, and uh, what are you supporting both as the back-end database and as the application-facing interface? Mm -hmm. So we start out with uh, data warehousing, and that is for a couple of reasons. That's um, primarily around the market trends, because if you look what's going on today in public cloud, you see a lot of databases like uh, Redshift, SQL DW, BigQuery, Snowflake, um, Greenplum, and AppsireDB, which really tackle the data warehousing space because this is something that customers are in desperate need of kind of moving, shifting the paradigm from owning technology to actually database as a service. And so that market trend is really what informed our go-to-market and our de development of the product to uh, tackle data warehousing initially. Long term, we obviously want to kind of broaden this and really kind of fill the entire matrix here and also go after more tactical and operational database systems. But initially, it's, it's all about the, the big data warehouses. And the list of, of data warehouses that we support right now is um, obviously Amazon uh, Redshift and SQL DW, uh, as well as uh, Snowflake, as well as Greenplum and AppsaraDB, and actually a couple of others as well. But these are really the ones where we see currently the, the major momentum around in the market, where people are currently trying to figure out, how do I move from my on-premise database, my data warehouse, to these systems? Uh, on, the, on the application side, we are primarily focusing right now on Teradata because we see a really strong kind of market movement away from that. And uh, Oracle is going to be the next supported system targeted currently for Q3. So that's the, that's the uh, overall landscape here. There is another subtlety in here uh, that I kind of already touched on a little bit. When you look at what we do, it is really between application and database. Think of it as kind of like a logical hypervisor. And to us, it actually doesn't matter so much what the database is in the sense that, well, we need to understand the language, the properties, and all this. But for example, where exactly the database is located is kind of secondary as long as there is connectivity. And that means this solution immediately also applies to private cloud or even to, to other on-premises installations. But obviously, the, the public cloud sees currently the, the biggest push. Now, on to the second part of your question. Um, what about fault tolerance, high availability, and all of these? The key element, the key insight here is that photometry HyperQ, this is the name of our product, is per se effectively a stateless server. It receives the requests as they come from the application, transforms them, sends it down to the database, and then on the way back does the translation of results. But that means many, or pretty much all of the public clouds today, have provisions for stateless servers to scale, to integrate with um, virtual IP, load balancers, et cetera. And so we nicely, really neatly fit into this, where just taking the standard implements that cloud service providers, and even on pri private cloud and on-premises, have come up to deal with um, making stateless servers fault tolerant and highly available, all of this immediately applies to HyperQ. And obviously, this was one of our design goals, not having to build any of this, and also removing the configuration from kind of becoming a burden to the enterprise, but really going with standard components. So it's really kind of a, a plug-and-play scenario. 